I don't like microphones, so I'm not using one. Uh, and I, there's reasons for that. Um, I strongly believe that there's a kind of emotional connection that happens between a speaker and an audience when their voice is perceived clearly. And I'm, what I'm talking about as per clearly is this sense of proximity that Tapio Loki is trying to, to, or at least has identified uh, as being very important and for which there's no current measure. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and I'm demonstrating it at the same time. OK. We all know that early reflections are really very important. Um, they give a vital sense of blend or ensemble to a group of musicians. And lateral reflections contribute a sense of space around performers. But unfortunately, how can we know when we have enough? And how can we know when we have too many? Because you can have too many early reflections. There's no question about it. Um, and we find that current acoustic measures do not adequately answer those questions. Uh, and to actually study the problem and to be able to develop a, such a measure, you need to have accurate laboratory tests of con concert hall conditions. And that's what I'm going to try and talk at least a little bit about. Um, anybody who's worked in the field of sound, particular sound recording or speakers or even uh, uh, radios and cars, knows that um, for any kind of sonic perception, the, they're very strongly influenced by vision, memory, and expectation. In fact, that's the way the brain works with respect to almost any perception. You get a little hint of what something is with your eyes or your ears, and your brain fills in the rest based on what you think the world should w work like. And for, for most sonic perceptions, particularly distance and localization, if your eyes are open, the brain trusts the eyes and mistrusts the ears. So you really can't hear those factors unless you've really trained yourself to do so, or unless you re regularly close your eyes. Now, research into any sonic perception requires rapid A-B comparisons of different stimuli through a system that accurately duplicates the sound field. That's a criterion for all acoustic research, which I've been doing all my life. And almost all research into acoustics lacks that basic requirement. And the result has not been pretty, in my opinion. Uh, I'm going to quote Lokey. I hope he doesn't think this is a misquote, but it's in his paper. Um, on, uh, on the perceptual properties of concert hall reflections. Of, uh, and he says, an interesting fact is that neither definition nor reverberance nor EDT, early decay time, or C80 explain preference at all. And we spent an enormous amount of time in this conference talking about these various things. And what Loki is finding is they don't affect uh, preference. He finds the only perceptual attitude that correlates with preference for all listeners in his study was unnamed, and he's currently calling it proximity. It's also unmeasurable. And I have been calling it for the last 10 years a number of things, engagement, clarity, or presence, none of which seems as good as proximity. So we'll go with that. Now, I notice that the paper that follow, follows me is going to be about intimacy. And I'm not sure it doesn't mean the same thing. Uh, maybe we'll find out in the next paper. Why did we not discover proximity sooner? Proximity describes the perception that a sound is actually sonically close to a listener. Um, and you can't study it with a visual image, because obviously it's visual. Um, that's the way brain would perceive it. To study proximity in a laboratory, your reproduction system must be able to re reproduce it. Now, let me just say something about this, that you could ask the question. It's a reasonable question. If you can detect it a distance visually, why does it matter that you can't detect it audit auditorily? And the answer to that is, well, it changes preference. Okay? It turns out your brain knows when it's sonically close, and it automatically commands your brain to pay more attention to it. That's evolution. If there's a sound that's close to you, you better listen to it. Okay? So it's a way of engaging attention. So proximity engages attention. That's why it's important. Most reproduction systems fail to reproduce proximity because it relies on phase coherence of upper harmonics in a signal. 
Okay, this is a, 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 just a, a graph here that shows the syllable two, my voice, filtered by two kilohertz and then a four kilohertz uh, critical band filter. And you can see you have these prominent spikes in it. The spikes are at the fundamental period. Okay, so this is at 100 hertz, and these wiggles are at 2,000 hertz, and these wiggles are at 4,000 hertz. The spikes are at 100 hertz, and the ear can detect them easily and powerfully. Okay, and that gives you the, that the brain says when it hears those, that sound is close to me. You add early reflections, this is a 40 millisecond all pass, pass filter, 40 milliseconds long, and this is what you get. The spikes are completely turned into a kind of random noise. Now, I will demonstrate what that sounds like. Um, if I record my voice with a microphone close to my mouth, the sound is very close to the ear of the listener, present, very clear. However, if I scramble the harmonics above 1000 hertz, the sound is very different. It might be perceived as distant or muddy. Now, I spent a considerable amount of time making this speaker to sound exactly like my voice. I don't know if you perceive that. Um, but it's pretty damn close, I think, uh, even in this. Uh, uh, but you can hear the very big difference. Now, um, to reproduce proximity, the rule is simple. You need one linear phase speaker per voice. This uh, speaker is linear phase from about 100 hertz up to um, 8 kilohertz or 10 kilohertz. So it is linear phase. Um, it is interesting enough, Edison knew that. And uh, these uh, live versus perform uh, recorded concerts that he put on in the, in the 1916s, um, used this diamond disc, disc phonograph, and it did that. You can see it's a, a direct connection, diamond to diaphragm to exponential horn, and he had these sopranos sing, and they were really right on, spot on. I heard one of these things um, in a museum playing a soprano, and it was like she was right in front of me. It was really real. Um, so that, that really works. Any reproduction that uses multiple speakers for a single source will fail to produce uh, proximity. And this includes ambisonics, because it, all the images come from multiple speakers. Um, I've never heard an ambisonics system that, does, that really makes a focused image. And the same is true of, of WFS, because those spikes are in the, in the presence range where there was spatial aliasing. It's very hard to do that with WFS. This is Tapio's system. I don't have to talk about it. Uh, his recording system uses multiple speakers, uh, one facing forward, one facing up, one speaker for each instrument. Okay, but does it really work? We don't know. It's the first system I've ever heard that, and to my opinion, makes a totally convincing reproduction of a concert hall. But is it the concert hall? Is it really the concert hall? We don't know. It really demands that we have a gold standard with which um, any kind of reproduction system can be compared. And such a thing exists. It's called binaural recording. It was done back in 1977 with uh, uh, Schroeder. Um, and it could have worked. His playback system is great. It's crosstalk uh, uh, cancellation. It requires the head be in a clap, clamp of the listener. It's not practical, but it works. The problem with his system was the source. He used two speakers on stage, reproducing the whole orchestra in stereo. And that does not work for producing proximity, so he didn't discover it this way. He could have. Too bad. We need to combine Loki's uh, recording mechanism with something more practical than that for playing it back. <laughs> the major problem with binaural reproduction is not the lack of head tracking, but the variability of headphones between individuals. My poster was about that. I'm sorry you didn't see it. I had graphs of all this. Um, and this part of the talk is, was really, it has to be the poster. Humans do not need head tracking for externally in sound. If head tracking is needed for believable binaural localization, you've done it wrong. And you can do it right. Here's a one way to do it right. These are probe microphones. This is the way I record. This is the way I play back. Note the, the probe that allows you to equalize the headphone at the eardrum. These phones work much better than circle moral ones. I've never succeeded to get good binaural recording through a circle moral phone. And those are all the ones people use. There are too many resonances inside that cup. We record using Loki's system. This, this is a string quartet with a soprano. That's the soprano. These are the instruments. There's dodex. We made lots of measurements there. And we record with my dummy head and a sound field microphone. And in this particular hall, 
The problem was not early reflections, it was reflections from the stage. But in any case, this is the second part. I want to talk about oralizing the effects of early reflections using existing binaural measurements. I didn't have to make a measurement to do this. It turns out I already had the measurements. Uh, during a little session with RPI in, uh, in Boston Symphony, I set up this speaker, which is a little um, five inch uh, Genelec, and my, my recording system. And we measured quite a few seats. I'm showing five here on the floor. I'm going to talk about this one, which is a seat I know from going to concert performance I do not like. This one's marginal. This is where I often sit. This one's actually better. Okay. These, these seats are all pretty damn good, and this one is better than most halls. All right, here is uh, Dee Dee, and here is a, uh, a sound field uh, plot, and this is a very strong uh, lateral reflection for, into the right ear. This is from the right wall, and this is the one from the left wall, okay? And you can see that these are actually double reflections. They're, they're first and second order combined from the underside of the balcony. Now, to make this work, you have to have the equalization correct. The source, the dummy, and the headphones have to match your, at your eardrum. That's vital. OK, well, so we equalized my early recordings by assuming the there was a flat power spectrum at about 160 milliseconds. Once that was done, things really fell into place. All right. Um, the direct sound modified slightly to align the head. Um, and here's some graphs. This was before the head was aligned. You can see the right ear. This is the direct sound, and it should be even. You can see the right ear is a little left than less, uh, left, left than, less than the left. Had to fix that. This is the spectrum of the early reflection. And you can see there's a dip here and a peak here that's characteristic of a double uh, interference. This is the spectrum of the reverberation. It's pretty flat. OK, here, in, this is the same thing in, in, row, in seat R11. And you can see a very strong uh, dip and peak, uh, characteristic of an interference for a double reflection. OK, now, we can create, this is one measurement. You can create one instrument with this. But you can make an ensemble using the same data, simply modifying the direct sound. So if we take the direct sound and we reduce this a little bit and change the time delay, we can make it sound 7.5 degrees to the left. And this one sounds 15 degrees to the left. Okay? And you can invert them to make them go right. All right. And you can also change the reverb time. So this is changed from unoccupied Boston Symphony to occupied Boston Symphony. That's just MATLAB. Another MATLAB strip can, strip can then generate three tracks. A binaural track for the direct sound only, a binaural track for the first reflection only, and a binaural track for the reverberation without the first reflection. You can play them all back together, and it sounds like that seat. And I know because I've sat on that seat, and it's very believable. Okay, um, I was surprised. So then you can put them into audition and play them and click on mute and decide which ones you're going to hear. And maybe I can, um, now that I know how to use the sound, um, I'll see if I can play some of these. All right, um, let's just play the direct only. Remember, it has no bass, but it should sound proximate. It should sound close to you. Ugh, what happened here? <laughs> It's not very loud. <laughs> you know, this direct sound took a long time to get here. That's almost all the way back. And all the way up. All right, let me play, play, play the direct plus first. It's very muddy to me. And if you listen to this binaurally, it's shifted strongly to the right. So you've lost the precise localization, and you've lost the proximity. Now I'm going to play all but no first reflection. first reflection. And I 
can assure you that's what that seat sounds like. We're just hearing mono right channel only. But that's what that seat sounds like. Um, and the other one has a clarity. It, you, in, in the one I just played, to me, the soprano is buried in the ensemble. She's just a big blur. And in the other one, she's very precise. And I, I prefer that. How can we equalize headphones individually? That was the subject of my poster, and you can talk to me about it later. How many, much time do I have? Not a lot. Not a lot. <laughs> All right, then I will wrap up. I know I started late, and I might be ending close to when I started. Um, the question is, is the difference in sound that we've just detected actually measurable? I have this measure called LOC, and I've talked about it before. I'm not going to talk about it now. I'm just going to tell you the results. Um, this is the LOC in the left ear in DD11. 6.7 is very high, so this is very good proximity in that seat for the left ear. However, on the right ear, it's 1.2, which is very low. Not good proximity. Now, the result that I've gotten from this experiment is that it matters. One ear can be good, one ear can be bad. What you perceive is the one from the bad ear, or you perceive proximity as predicted by the bad ear. So when I delete the reflection, proximity 1.2 goes up to 5.6. And that's good. And you can hear that difference. And so I think the LOC measure is the best one I know at the moment. This was the Y center I showed you a little bit before. The difference was not subtle, but it was the curtains that mattered. Here, here's the stage reflections here in the Y center. These are garbage from the stage. Put the curtains on stage, you get this. It's, it was much better. The client was really happy. <laughs> All right. Um, LOC also, uh, the uh, reverb time also went down, which is helpful. All right. <clears throat> so um, conclusions. Binaural technique can be a, a practical standard by which against other hall research techniques can be judged. But ideally, this requires individual headphone equalization. My poster shows that this can be done by anybody in about 10 minutes if they're willing to do it. It's not a big deal, but you don't want a circumoral phone. Existing binaural da data can be balanced and equalized to yield a very good snapshot of sound in a particular seat, and it can be further manipulated to discover uh, why the sound is good or how to prove it when it's not. And you can also make a whole ensemble out of a single measurement. Loki has all these speakers on stage. To some degree, you could replace that by a much smaller number of speakers and manipulate the responses uh, to save you a lot of work. Using these techniques, we find the first order lateral ref uh, reflections in Boston Symphony are excessive, excessive. Deleting them in every case results in improved sound or no improvement at all if the seat is already really good. So that's the conclusion. Um, I, I just want to point out there are good shoebox halls. We're not talking about them here. But this new hall in Nashville is, I think, absolutely stunning. Uh, and if you ever have a chance to go to National, I really think you should check it out. Okay? And uh, I have one more comment. Uh, I was very begeistered, if you will, by um, Jürgen Meyer's comment at the end of his talk that none of the composers he's ever studied expected audience members to be sitting behind the orchestra. Um, and I have been hearing in this conference a great deal about surround halls where a great many people are sitting behind the orchestra for reasons which might be very practical and important and part of the brief that you can't modify. Um, but I think we should talk much more about the disadvantages of having really poor orchestral balance that many of you experienced last night. I have to say, my seat was absolutely wonderful. I was delighted with the sound. It was fabulous. Um, but I was right in the center of the first balcony. And I recommend that you want to go to the Philharmonie. Go there. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. A question. Um, would you say there is a conflict between... Uh, hello, David. I'm here. Uh, you, would you say there is a conflict between proximity and uh, source broadening, parent source width? Absolutely. Um, but you see, the parents, this is a big beef I have. The parents worked with the rows because the BBC was, well, in Schroeder too, was doing concertal experiments where they reproduced a whole string orchestra through two loudspeakers on stage. 
And they said, this does not sound natural. It needs to have a broader image. So they decided source broadening, which happens when you get beyond the gym and distance where localization is possible, um, was a desirable property of concert halls. And it's not, in my opinion. I think it's, it's, a, mis it's a miscomprehension of a very important property. Um, every time I go to a symphony orchestra, I listen to the woodwinds, which are precisely localized. If I go to listen to a string quartet, I want to hear each instrument and know where it goes, where it's playing. I want to know which, note played, which instrument played each note with my eyes closed. If I can't, I'll find another seat. Okay? And that's because it's engaging. It, 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 it draws my brain into the music to have that happen. And if you're asking that those sources be broadened to the point where they overlap even, you're asking the wrong question. Pardon for the impassioned answer. Thank you. Um, OK. Next. You yeah, sure. Is it anti-Kushina? Kushina. 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 Kushina